Hello, good morning, and welcome to An Academy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. Let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu Newspaper. These are the topics that we shall be discussing today. Topic, page number, and the relevance, whether relevant for GS1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth. But before we start, an announcement you all have been waiting for. Sir, when are you launching Conquer Prelims Crash Course for Prelims 2024? And we have a good news. Instead of one crash course, we are coming up with two. One, which will cover the static portion of your syllabus. The other, which will cover the current affairs of the past one and a half years. One will be on the Unacademy app, the other on the YouTube channel. One will start from the 19th of April and will end on the 7th of June and the other on our YouTube channel will start on the 1st of May and will end on 31st of May. We will have 50 sessions on the Unacademy app, 31 sessions on our YouTube channel and please note the timings. 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Unacademy app, 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. on our YouTube channel. And if you want the breakup, we will have six classes on Indian polity covering the static portion of your syllabus and five classes on YouTube covering the current affairs of the past one and a half years. We will have sessions on economy, history, international relations, geography, environment and ecology, others, which includes places and news, reports and indices, India yearbook. So both these are very important crucial for your upcoming prelims examination, I urge you to attend both these sessions, but attend them live. Because if you do not attend them live, then you procrastinate and ultimately you miss out. And for this, you will have to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't yet. And to access these classes on our app, you will have to follow us on An Academy. So the link to follow is provided in the video description. If you are excited about these two sessions, please do not forget to press the like button. Let me know in the comment section. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet and share the links of these sessions with your friends and fellow aspirants. Let's get started and look at the big news. Iran warns Israel retaliation will trigger larger response if Israel retaliates to the Iranian attack. And then there is another newspaper article which talks about by attacking Israel, Iran signals strategic patience is over. Now to understand these two newspaper articles, let me give you some context. Something happened on October 7, 2023. What happened? Hamas crossed the Palestinian or Gaza and Israeli border and attacked Israeli citizens, killing hundreds of them and more than 250 were taken hostage. In response to that, Israel launched an attack on Gaza and then launched attacks on other areas in Palestinian territories as well, which led to calls by some international community members that what Israel is doing is genocide. South Africa and others, they have already dragged Israel to International Court of Justice and let's see what will happen in that case. But when Israel attacked Hamas and launched a war, a counter-attack in Gaza, it also swelled to other areas. Other areas in the sense? Listen to me carefully. We have Iran. And then there is something called Arab Spring. Something happened in 2011, where if you look at Middle East, these Gulf countries, these are predominantly undemocratic countries, monarchies, kingdoms. In 2011, there was a movement which came to be known as Arab Spring, which started from Tunisia. Then it shifted to Egypt, then in Libya, 
then in Syria, then Bahrain and other countries. What was this movement all about? This movement was for democratic rights. This movement was for the introduction of democracy in these predominantly dictatorial, authoritarian and monarchy countries. It also led to the change of regime. For example, in Egypt, Hosni Mubarak was ousted. In Libya, Muammar Gaddafi was ousted. He was in fact killed as well. But one thing or one country where it significantly failed was Syria, where we have Bashar al-Assad, who is heading the government in Syria. He was to be ousted because there was Arab Spring, which spread to, Lib uh, which spread to Syria as well. But this leader, Bashar al-Assad, was supported by Iran, was supported by Russia, to a large extent by China as well, to a large extent by North Korea as well. And ultimately, Bashar al-Assad, he stayed firm and he continues to rule Syria. Although there are territories in Syria which are under the control of protesters, which are backed by United States, backed by NATO. So Iran has one partner in this region, which is Bashar al-Assad's Syria. It also has support from other terrorist organizations. For example, Houthis of Yemen. For example, Hezbollah of Lebanon. When the conflict between Hamas and Israel started, Israel also started attacking the Houthis. United States also came to the aid of Israel and started attacking Houthis because what these Houthis did, they blocked Red Sea, which is an important sea route. And they were also involved in piracy in Red Sea. They started blocking the vessels in the Red Sea in solidarity with their Palestinian brothers. And ultimately, US was also waded into this war, into this conflict in the Middle East. So Israel started attacking Gaza, Hamas, other Palestinian territories, started also attacking some of the areas in Syria, some of the areas which are under the control of Houthis and Hezbollah. Now, what has also happened is Iran is considered to be aspiring for a power position in the Middle East. And this is where it is in conflict with Saudi Arabia. It is also in conflict with Qatar. It is also in conflict with United Arab Emirates. And this can be viewed from the larger prism of Shia Sunni conflict. Because Iran is predominantly a Shia dominated country. And Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, these are Sunni dominated countries. In fact, before this attack on October 7, 2023, there were already talks that finally we might see some kind of diplomatic relations between these Sunni dominated countries and Israel. But all that disappeared because of these attacks because of the attacks by Hamas on the Israeli territory, because of the hostages, and because of the counter-attack by Israel on Gaza, on other Palestinian territories. Now, something else has happened. In Damascus, in Syria, an installation was attacked, which led to the killing of top general of Iran. And Iran now says, we will retaliate, we will attack Israel. And Iran did that. And this is for the first time that Iran has attacked Israel from the Iranian soil. Previously, Iran would attack Israel, but through its proxies, who may be Houthis, who may be Hezbollah, who may be other terrorist organizations, but not directly from the Iranian soil. And this has happened for the first time. And in fact, for the first time since the Gulf War of 1991, there has been a direct attack on Israel on, from the soil of any other country. And this speaks to a larger pattern. And what is that pattern? Something happened in 2020. Qasem Soleimani, who was considered to be the top general, a very close aide of the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, he was attacked by a drone strike in Iraq by United States. 
and in response to that, Iran also retaliated and attacked the air bases of United States in Iraq. And now with these attacks, we see that something substantial has happened, something significant has happened, which might snowball into a wider conflict, a wider war in Middle East. Unless and until the international community comes together, puts pressure on both these countries that you need to de-escalate and you need not to take law into your own hands. The larger picture is that about after this attack, which killed a major general in Damascus, which is allegedly perpetrated by Israel. Now, what has happened? Iran has attacked Israel. Close to 300 drones and missiles were fired at Israel from the Iranian soil, obviously because of the top defense system that Israel has, which has been largely funded by United States. United States is an ally of Israel. Israel has been able to withstand all this attack. And you can say that this attack had minimal impact on Israel. Apart from the fact that a seven-year-old girl was grievously injured, there was no other damage to Israel in these attacks. But these attacks signify something significant. Number one, what is the policy of the United States? What is the policy of US President Joe Biden? Joe Biden initially supported Israel, saying it is Israel's right to self-defense. Because Israel has been attacked by Hamas, Israel has the right to retaliate, Israel has the right to defend itself. In fact, weapons, ammunition were provided by United States. But over a period of time, when there were newspaper reports that Israel has also leveled some of the hospitals in Gaza, has also killed innocent civilians in Gaza, there were talks of genocide being perpetrated by Israel, United States try to persuade Israel that you should hold your fire, let's have ceasefire, at least during the holy month of Ramzan. It didn't happen. So United States basically told Israel that you may not be getting this leeway forever because public sentiment is against you because you have lost that public sentiment now because of the grievous human rights violations or allegations of human rights violations against you. In fact, there are elections in the United States as well. Donald Trump is the ardent supporter of Israel. The Democratic Party of Joe Biden, they get the support from the liberals of the United States as well. And those liberals are against Israel. So now there is a delicate balance that Joe Biden has to play because of the upcoming elections as well. He cannot not side with Israel because of various reasons, because of politics, because of funding that some of the Jewish people give United States president, give their political parties in United States. But at the same time, it cannot antagonize those liberal voters who support Democratic Party as against the grand old party, as against the Republican Party, because Israel is accused of committing human rights violations. Now, that is going to be the challenging thing to, to anticipate what is going to be the response of United States? What is going to be the response of Joe Biden? How United States will play an important role in de-escalating tensions in the Middle East? Israel is in a fix. The Prime Minister Netanyahu is in a fix. One, if he does not attack, Israel, attack Iran now, because Iran has attacked. If Israel does not launch a counter-attack against Iran, Netanyahu will be considered as a weak prime minister because he is in power because of his strong arm tactics, because of his image, because of the image that he is a strong leader who is going to defend Israel at any cost and the Israeli citizens at any cost. If he does not attack, he will be considered weak. If he attacks, it is going to spiral a conflict where other important regional leaders will also get involved. And this may fuel a larger battle, a larger war in Middle East. And then what about Iran? This attack by Iran on Israel gives us a sense that Iran is signaling that strategic patience is over. What is the strategic patience? Previously, Iran was attacked. Sanctions were imposed on Iran. Some of the important generals were killed. 
Some of the important leaders were assassinated. But even then, I Iran would not retaliate in this manner, in this fashion. But Iran attacked the U.S. air bases in Iraq after the killing and the assassination of Qasem Soleimani in 2020. Iran also attacked when it launched an attack on Iraq again because some of these installations were supported by Israel. This happened last year. What happened also this year was Iran also attacked Pakistani territory of Balochistan because there were some terrorist organizations which wanted to liberate the Sistan Balochistan province of Iran from Iran. So from 2020 onwards, we see a new thinking in the minds of the Iranian policy makers by attacking, by seeking revenge of the killing and the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, by attacking the Israeli bases or those territories which are, or those areas which seem to be closer to Israel in Iraq, by attacking the Balochistan province in Pakistan and by these attacks, signaling that strategic patience is over. Iran is now signaling that we are ready for a conflict. And if this conflict widens, it will pull United States into this conflict. It will pull other Middle Eastern countries into this conflict as well. And it is going to signal a doom for the world economy. What about India? India has to play very diplomatically. How? There are close to 10,000 Indians in Israel. Or some reports say there are close to 18,000 Indians in Israel. There are roughly 5,000 to 10,000 Indians in Iran as well. So we have to take care of our diaspora. There are lakhs of Indians working in the Middle East. Their lives will also be in danger if there is a larger conflict in the Middle East. But at the same time, we have cultural ties. And we have strategic ties. with Middle East countries, with Israel as well. Let's not forget, during the Kargil War of 1999, it was Israel which helped India. After the 2611 attacks on Bombay, it was Israel which supported us strategically by giving us a lot of defense technology. But at the same time, if we look at Iran, Shabahar port, Because if we want access to Afghanistan, if we want access to the Central Asia, we have to take the Pakistani route. But Pakistan will not allow us to enter Afghanistan or the Central Asia, will not give us access to the Central Asia. For that, we have to take a different route. And that different route goes through the Chabahar port in Iran, which India is funding. So we have to maintain a delicate balance without supporting either Israel or Iran and diplomatically ensure that both these countries, they de-escalate. Because we have cultural ties, we have strategic ties with these countries. And not just that, we depend on energy, crude oil from Middle East. In fact, for a long time, Iran used to be one of the most important principal suppliers of crude oil to India. But because of the sanctions imposed on Iran by United States and other countries, we have reduced or almost zero import of crude oil from Iran. And what are these sanctions for? Because the world alleged that Iran is trying to manufacture a nuclear bomb. That is why there was a treaty. There was an agreement called Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is also known as Iranian Nuclear Deal, which was signed between P5 plus one country and Iran, five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, which is US, UK, France, Russia, and China, plus Germany, who is not the permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. This landmark agreement was signed, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, also known as Iranian Nuclear Deal, by which Iran gave up its potential to manufacture a nuclear bomb. But in return, some of the sanctions should have been revoked. But Donald Trump, when he was the president of the United States of America, he, he, he unilaterally withdrew from this Iranian nuclear deal. So there were sanctions imposed on Iran because it was alleged that Iran is manufacturing a nuclear weapon. 
And because of these sanctions, India also reduced its oil import from Iran. But look what happened when there was a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. We started importing crude oil from Russia at discounted prices. But if there is a war in the Middle East between Israel and Iran and other countries, the crude oil prices will skyrocket and it is going to impact India as well. Not just that, the strategic ties that we have with Israel because of the defense agreements, the cultural ties that we have with Iran, and let's not forget, when IOA, International Association of Islamic Countries, when it tried to introduce a resolution in United Nations calling for condemning India for alleged human rights violations in Jammu and Kashmir, it was Iran which blocked that resolu resolution. So Iran and India, we have had cultural relations, we have had diplomatic relations and good relations with each other. In fact, we share the same concerns vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban establishment in Afghanistan, the kind of atrocities that Taliban is perpetrating against the minorities in Afghanistan. So we share similar wavelength on important issues such as Pakistan, such as Afghanistan, so we cannot seem to be antagonizing Iran, we cannot be seen to be antagonizing Israel as well. That is why we have to maintain a delicate and we have to walk a delicate tightrope when it comes to the conflict between these two countries. And for that we can only hope and we need diplomatic intervention by India to help de-escalate the situation in the Middle East. That is what you need to understand from these two newspaper articles. Is that clear? Let's look at something else. Urbanization, no liberating force for Dalits. What is urbanization? Basically a process where people migrate from rural areas to urban areas, to cities. What is a city? A place where the predominant economic activity is non-agricultural. Why do people migrate from rural areas to cities? In search of jobs, better standard of living, better education, better health care, better sanitation. And this is where we need to understand the viewpoint of the Mahatma and the viewpoint of Dr. Ambedkar. For Mahatma Gandhi, India lives in the villages. Villages should become self-sufficient. That is why we have a directive principle of state policy under Part 4 of the Constitution, under Article 40, which talks about that the state shall take steps to organize village panchayats and empower them with powers so as to enable them to function as units of rural, local self-government. So Mahatma Gandhi believed in the concept of villages. Villages should be self-sufficient. Villages should be empowered. Gram Swaraj. But Dr. Ambedkar was against it. Dr. Ambedkar said, these villages, it is a working plant of Hindu social order. If you want to understand caste, you need to go to a village. If we empower these villages, caste atrocities will continue to persist. Caste will flourish in India. That is why he was against giving autonomy to villages. And that is why Dr. Ambedkar, as well as another stalwart, Jyotira Pule, they believed in the opportunities that can be afforded in cities. And what are these opportunities? Why urbanization was viewed as a liberating thing for Dalits by Dr. Ambedkar, by uh, Jyotira Phule? Two things. Number one, in cities, what we see in villages that we will not see in cities, according to Dr. Ambedkar. And what do we see in villages? There is segregation of Dalits into ghettos. For example, in a particular village, there is one area which is reserved for Dalits. Only Dalits reside there. So these, are, these Dalits are not allowed to mingle with the rest of the population in that village. They are forced to stay in one part of that village in a ghetto. That we will not see in a city according to Dr. Ambedkar, according to Jyotira Phule. In villages, 
we also see restrictions on economic activities for example if you have watched that movie by ashutosh gowarikar uh, shahrukh khan starter swades when he on the insistence of kaveri amma he goes to a village by crossing a river he goes to a village to get the loan back what was that individual doing he was primarily i think an iron smith but he shifted he tried to try his hands on agriculture but he was not allowed to do that by the village because how can you change your economic profession you have to remain in the ladder in which you are born that is why people said dr ambedkar said this caste system is like a hierarchical system it's like a building with so many floors but without a ladder you are you're dead in the story in which you are born so there is restriction on economic activity there is segregation of dalits into ghettos and villages and at the same time there is denial of land ownership they are denied land ownership that we will not see in the city according to dr ambedkar according to jyotirav phule and jyotirav phule believed that one thing that fascinated me and fascinates me about cities is the anonymity you are known by the skill that you have not by the caste that you possess not by the family in which you were born but what this writer talks about he says look at the cities in india and in cities outside the home you see name plates and these name plates flaunt the caste identity so if jyotira phule believed that in cities we will feel anonymous that anonymity is not seen in the indian cities today because of the displaying of name plates which flounces your caste identity so where is anonymity dr ambedkar in 1935 36 he wrote an autobiographical account of himself known as waiting for a visa and in that he reflects that he faced a lot of time a challenging time he talked about his ordeal in finding a house in baroda which is a city despite this dr ambedkar believed in the promise of urbanization dr ambedkar also saw that dalits who are skill based they are denied employment opportunities in textile mills despite that despite this fact despite the fact that he faced a challenging time in finding a house in baroda he still believed in urbanization he still believed in the promise of the cities but then what are we looking at how do we sociologically analyze indian cities today let's look at what french philosopher or french sociologist louis dumont talked about he talked about understanding the social structure by looking at a binary binary in the form of purity and pollution he says we have to look at the indian social system through this binary prism of purity and pollution brahmins who are at the top of the hierarchy who are from the priestly class they are pure their dressing sense their food habits their drinking habits they are all pure and those so called untouchables they are impure their their dress habits their food habits drinking habits they are all impure and now to add to this purity and pollution binary we have another thing called neat in 2017 uttar pradesh government issued regulations that meat shops there should be a ban on selling meat near religious places blank paint paint or curtains should be placed should be on the facade of the shop why because it will cause pollution to the members of the upper castes there was a time when dr ambedkar could not drink water in his school because the well from which he was authorized to drink water it was dry because there used to be separate wells for dalits and separate wells for the upper castes because of this binary purity and pollution you are impure you have 
you need not to come in the close vicinity of the upper castes. And now we see another binary created in the form of meat. That is why there was a survey which was conducted and it said the biggest hurdle of finding a place, a rented accommodation in the cities is whether you are a vegetarian or a non-vegetarian. So that is creating another binary, vegetarian, non-vegetarian, purity, pollution. Look at the chaos or the cacophony of noises that took place after Zomato tried to introduce a policy wherein it said that we will have separate uh, boxes, green color, which will display, which will convey that we have sourced this order from a vegetarian restaurant. And this is a vegetarian order, pure vegetarian order. Then there was a chaos. There was a lot of commentary saying this is going to jeopardize the lives and the security of those who eat non-veg. Because during the Navratri, if you are eating non-veg and if you're ordering non-veg and you will see a red box coming to your resident, coming to your society, the Resident Welfare Association will stop it. So another binary of purity and pollution. And look at the election campaigns that are going on. There is one opposition leader from Bihar, Tejashvi Yadav, who was caught eating uh, fish or who who openly professed eating fish, although he said it was before the Savan season, but Prime Minister Modi has attacked him. So now this meat, vegetarian, non-vegetarian, this binary has also entered the election language. And what this author says is that there have been numerous studies which have been conducted. It says that Muslims and the Dalits, they are also forced into ghettos in, even in the cities. And the places that they inhabit, inhabit, we don't see good drinking water or sanitation afforded to these areas. According to this author, we also see that there are areas which are slums or those areas which are landfills where the dirt is being stored. Most of these areas are inhabited by Dalits and Muslims. So according to this author, through lived experience and extensive research, what we can see today is that Indian city has failed the aspirations and expectations that Dalit liberation movement had placed on in urbanization. So the promise that Dr. Ambedkar, the promise that Jyotirav Phule saw in urbanization, we have failed to live up to those promises and expectations. And despite urbanization, what we can see, Dalits continue to remain, according to Dr. Ambedkar's words, the children of India's ghettos. That is what you need to understand from this topic, urbanization, no liberating force, for Dalits. Let's look at something else. Breach of convention. There is a South American country, Ecuador, and there is a North American country, Mexico. On the left side, you will see the Pacific Ocean can be important for your map-based questions. In Ecuador, there was an election last year the incumbent government lost power and Mr. Nobo took office. Now, what he did, he launched his campaign against corruption. And because of his campaign against corruption, the former president, he was convicted for corruption. The former president, Mr. Correa, he left to Belgium. Then the vice president, who was also about to be convicted for corruption, what he did, he took refuge in the Mexico's embassy in Quito. He took refuge in the Mexico's embassy in Ecuadorian capital, Ecuador. But what Ecuador did, it raided this Mexico's embassy, which this editorial says is a breach of convention. It violates Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. And for that, what we need to understand is what is this Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations? This convention 
was signed in 1961, although it entered into force in 1964. And this was the product of the Cold War between USSR and United States. You would know after the Second World War, the world emerged bipolar. On one side, we have the United States. On the other side, we have the USSR. There were countries which were aligned to either of the two blocks, although there were countries which were non-aligned, such as India, such as some countries in Africa. But then what used to happen is that these power blocks, they would arrest, detain, torture, sometimes kill as well the diplomats of each other's countries. And it would make life for a diplomat difficult. It would make the work of a diplomat difficult because you always had these Damocles sword hanging on your head that at any point in time you can be arrested, detained and you will not be allowed to function without any fair without any favor. And that is how United Nations decided to come together. Some countries decided to come together and this convention was signed called Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations 1961, which entered into force in 1964. According to this, if this is the embassy, this embassy is inviolate. For example, we have the US Embassy in Moscow or we have the Russian Embassy in Washington DC. Russia or Russian troops, Russian army, Russian police, Russian administration cannot enter this US Embassy without the permission of the head of the embassy because this embassy is inviolate. Without the permission of the head of the mission, you cannot dare enter this territory. So, although this territory is in your territory, but this is inviolate, you cannot enter, according to Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. In fact, this protection extends to the residence of the diplomat as well. If you are a diplomat and you reside at a particular location, a particular flat or a particular house, the host country cannot enter the private residence of this diplomat as well. That is also inviolate. In fact, if this diplomat commits any crime, you cannot be arrested as well. So this diplomat who is posted at an embassy, he gets complete immunity. No matter what you do, what crimes you commit, you cannot be arrested by the host country. Maximum what you can be do, what can be done against you is that you can be declared as persona non grata. For example, Ecuador declared Mexico's ambassador as persona non grata. Why? Because Mexico commented on the free and fairness of the elections in Ecuador. He was declared persona non grata. And what do we mean by persona non grata? A specific time period is provided to you. And within that time period, you have to leave the host country. Otherwise, you can be arrested. But those Diplomats, listen to me carefully, those diplomats who are posted at the embassy, they enjoy complete immunity. But what about those diplomats or officers who are posted at consulates? For example, we have the US Embassy in New Delhi, but we have the consulate office in Hyderabad, in Chennai, in Kolkata. What about those officers who are posted at those consulates? they do not enjoy complete immunity. They enjoy protection under Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. What about the officers who are posted here? They cannot be arrested pending trial except in grave crimes. So those officers, those diplomats who are posted at embassies, there is one embassy of a country in a country, they are enjoying complete immunity, they cannot be arrested. Maximum what, what action can be taken against them, they can be declared as persona non grata and they have to leave this country. But those who are posted at consulates, 
they enjoy protection in the form of not complete immunity. They cannot be arrested pending trial. So trial has to take place. Then they can be arrested. Except in grave crimes. But what are these grave crimes? We don't know. Not defined. And this is where we come across two examples that I have picked from this news. One is Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, who was wanted in UK, who was wanted by Australia, who was wanted by United States. But what he did, he entered the Ecuador's embassy in United Kingdom and stayed there for multiple years. The police could not enter the Ecuador embassy. Why? Because that embassy is inviolate. You cannot enter without the permission of the head of the mission. So irony is, Ecuador has raided the Mexico's embassy, violating Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, where for large number of years, Ecuador would give refuge to Julian Assange in its embassy in United Kingdom, in London. It was only many years later that Ecuador, they decided to allow the Scotland Yard, the police in UK to arrest Julian Assange. And there is a case, ongoing case against Julian Assange continuing. But then the curious case of Devyani Khobragade. Yesterday, she is an ambassador to Cambodia. She was wishing the Cambodians on their new year and she was dressed as Apsara to mark the new year celebration in Cambodia. She was also arrested in United States. So she was posted as Deputy Consul General in United States many, many years ago, 2013, I guess. But then there was allegation against her that she has committed visa fraud. She has given incorrect statements to the authorities. There was a case that uh, she was torturing her domestic maid, which she had hired from India. Her husband as well. Allegations. But then she was arrested. She was strip searched. And she was kept in the prison with the drug addicts. India protested, saying this is violation of Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. How can you arrest our diplomat? Because she enjoys complete immunity under Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. United States said no, she does not enjoy immunity. Why? Because Devyani Khobragade was not the ambassador in an embassy in United States. She was posted at a consulate. She was Deputy Consul General in United States at an Indian consulate in United States. So maximum, she can get protection under Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, which means she may not be arrested pending trial except in grave crimes. And United States said, what Devyani Khobargade has done, she has committed a grave crime by giving misleading statements to the authorities by committing visa fraud. And she was arrested, strip searched and kept in prison with drug addicts. Then what India did, India immediately shifted Devyani Khobargade from the consulate in United States to United Nations. And those officers were posted in United Nations. They also enjoy complete immunity under Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, 1961. Then she was allowed to leave United States, but the case is still pending. She was allowed to leave United States. She is not going back to United States. Now she is the ambassador of India to Cambodia. But be that as it may, what this editorial talks about, Ecuador should stay within the limits of international laws not violate Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. And what Mexico has done, it has dragged Ecuador to International Court of Justice in Hague, Netherlands. Because whenever there is a dispute between two countries, that dispute can be filed in the International Court of Justice. And what Mexico is demanding, Ecuador should be expelled from the United Nations. That is what you need to understand from this editorial breach of convention.
Let's look at another topic, fixing India's VVPAT based audit of electronic voting machines. This is the topic that we have covered in the past. I will briefly summarize and then we are done with this topic. Electronic voting machines were first used in a by-election to Paravarur constituency in Kerala in 1982. VVPAT was introduced for the first time on the directions of the Supreme Court in 2013 and the first time it was used was in a Noxon constituency in Nagaland. But what is this VVPAT? There was one concern with electronic voting machine and that concern was transparency. Transparency in the sense, I entered the polling booth, I entered the voting compartment, I pressed the button on the electronic voting machine, but I'm not sure whether this vote has been registered correctly or not. I voted for party A, whether my vote has been registered in favor of party A or party B or party C, I don't know. So there is no transparency in the system. That is why a VVPAT is added to an electronic voting machine, is linked to an electronic voting machine. And what is this VVPAT? Voter Verifiable Paper Audit Trail. What is this voter verifiable paper audit trail? As soon as I press the button on the electronic voting machine, there is a display which displays three crucial information. One, what is the serial number of my vote? Second, what is the name of the candidate against whom my vote has been registered? Three, what is the symbol of that political party? Or what is the symbol of that candidate? Seven seconds, this information is displayed then it gets printed and it drops in the ballot box. But we need to then verify whether the votes registered under EVM and the votes registered under VVPAT, whether they are both matching or not. Matching in the sense that is how you can build trust in the system. If for example, you counted EVMs and after counting EVMs, you would say, Candidate A got 100 votes, candidate B got 50 votes, candidate C got 15 votes. You need to match it with VVPAT as well. Because this VVPAT slip will be in the ballot box. So then you need to count these slips as well. And this count should also say that A got 100, B got 50, C got 15. That is how you can match. That is how people can trust the system. Initially, what Election Commission of India would do, this is a parliamentary constituency. And in a parliamentary constituency, which is a big constituency, there may be, there are smaller assembly constituencies as well. Because a group of assembly constituencies form a parliamentary constituency. What Election Commission of India would do, it will from one assembly constituency, in this parliamentary constituency, pick one random EVM and then match it with the VVPATs. That means from one assembly constituency, one EVM will be taken, it will be matched with the VVPAT slips to see whether there is a match or not, whether there is a 100% match or not. On the directions of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court told and directed the election commission, not one, you should take five, five EVMs per assembly constituency in a parliamentary constituency should be matched with the VVPAT slips. Now there is a petition before the Supreme Court saying no, not five EVMs per assembly constituency, we need 100%. All the EVMs should be matched with VVPAT slips. There are some who say, no, it should be 25%. No, it should be 50%. Some say it should be 100%. And what this article basically talks about, it talks about what we should, what or what formula or what methodology should we use for matching these VVPAT slips. Because even if these VVPAT slips are matched with EVMs, what is the result of that matching? We don't know. Whether, whether these VVPAT slips 100% match with the EVM count or not, we don't know. 
and that is what this column says a supreme court should definitely ask election commission of india what is the final tally what is the result between the vv pat counting and the evm counting but maybe 100% matching is not required but election commission of india should decide should define the criteria on the basis of how do you select these evms for matching but that is what you need to understand from this newspaper column let's look at some of the important topics for prelims protest erupt in manipur over killing of two kuki zo village volunteers but from this topic what you need to understand is what is this zero fir police register zero fir bodies yet to be returned listen to me carefully there's a woman who is molested or raped at this place e clear but she is from a place b after she is unfortunately raped she goes back to her place b and she wants to register the fir the first information report the police station here will not register it why because the police will say this is not our under our jurisdiction because you have to file an fir register an fir ask for an fir only at a place where the crime was committed but this woman cannot go back to that place because she is under trauma or maybe the perpetrator would threaten this individual the year was 2012 nirbhaya was gang raped in a moving bus the date i think was november december 16 2012 nirbhaya along with a friend they were coming back from uh, after watching a movie at a multiplex in delhi and she was gang raped by five six men one of them was a juvenile she was then thrown out of the bus and then the bus was made to travel on top of her even the partner was also assaulted she fought a battle wanted to survive she was also taken to singapore hospital but ultimately she succumbed there was a lot of hue and cry when that gang rape happened and then the government set up a committee headed by former chief justice of india justice j s verma this committee was constituted so that this committee can suggest what are the changes that we need to incorporate in our criminal law which will provide for faster trial so that the trial takes place faster because there is our judicial system is notorious for time consuming for delays immortalized by uh, sunny deol when he says tarikh pe tarikh pe tarikh so should you recommend what are the steps that you can recommend for faster trial and what are the punishments how can we enhance the punishment for those who are perpetrating crimes against women and justice jas verma committee recommended zero fir what is the zero fir no matter where the crime has been committed even if the crime is not committed in the jurisdiction of this police station i approach this police station it has to register this fir but no number will be assigned to this fir that is why it is called zero fir so this lady can go to a police station b even if the crime was not committed here the police will have to register this report it will not assign any number that is why it is called zero fir and then this police station will transfer this complaint to the police station where the crime was committed so you can register this fir at any police station even if the crime was not committed in that police station but then this police station will transfer this fir to the concerned police station now this police station will register the fresh fir and will order the investigation which will and it will conduct the investigation but if you look at this term fir first information report it is not mentioned in indian penal code it is not mentioned in the criminal procedure code of 1973 
it's not mentioned. This term is not mentioned. But yes, the regulations and rules of police, they do mention first information report. But for that, there are three conditions. Condition number one, the information must relate to the commission of a cognizable offense. Offenses can be either cognizable or non-cognizable. What is a cognizable offense? If you have committed this offense, the police can arrest you without the warrant by the judge, without the warrant by the magistrate. That is a cognizable offense. In a non-cognizable offense, the police cannot arrest you without the warrant issued by the magistrate. So for FIR, the condition is that this offense should be cognizable. That means FIR is registered for a cognizable offense. Second, what is this first information report? For example, a crime has been committed somewhere. Who will report the first information regarding that cognizable offense? That is what we call FIR. That means somebody will approach the police. Either I will approach the police orally or through written format. I will give a written complaint, information about that cognizable offense. Or I will orally tell the police that I was assaulted or a crime has been committed somewhere. That is what we call FIR. And what the police will do, it will write this complaint, it will write down this information and will give it to the complainant. You sign it. And I will mention it in the police diary. These three things constitute FIR. Long story short, what are we talking about? Zero FIR. But what is an FIR? This term is not mentioned either in Indian Penal Code or in Criminal Procedure Code of 1973. But yes, the regulations and rules of police talk about FIR. But what is this FIR? Somebody approaching the police, giving the first information about a cognizable offence. The police is writing down this complaint, this information. And after writing it down, is giving the copy to this complainant. You sign on this document. Now this constitutes first information report. But sir, what about Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sanhita? Because from June, it is this law which will replace criminal procedure code. And it is this Bharatiya Sanhita which talks about zero FIR. Which gives a statutory backing to zero FIR. It also talks about EFIR. It also talks about preliminary inquiry before FIR. Zero FIR we would know. Zero FIR is basically to provide speedy redressal to victim so that timely action can be taken after filing of the FIR. Electronic FIR is, as the name suggests, you can electronically, without approaching the police, electronically you can file this first information report. But please listen to me carefully, can be asked in your prelims exam. Within three days, the complainant has to sign the document. Because in an FIR, what is the condition? This information must be written down and signed by the informant. Similarly, if you are filing an FIR electronically, within three days, you have to sign this information. That is EFIR. And then there is something called preliminary, preliminary inquiry before filing an FIR. What is that? This Bharatiya Sanhita says, this new law which will replace criminal procedure court. Listen to me carefully. If there is an offence for which the punishment is three years or more, but less than seven years, before filing an FIR, the police officer 
not below the rank of the DSP, Deputy Superintendent of Police, should first conduct a preliminary inquiry and then register the FIR. So you may be asked about zero FIR, EFIR, preliminary inquiry before FIR with these details in your prelims examination. So please keep note of this information can be important for your prelims exam. Clear? Let's look at another topic. Center orders probe into foreigners receiving organs as the number of transplant surges. What does that mean? What is the information that you need to keep in mind from this newspaper article? There's a law called Transplantation of Human Organs Act 1994. Have you heard of this law? You may have. But do you know that this law was passed by Indian Parliament by taking recourse to Article 252 of the Constitution? What is Article 252? If two or more states request the Parliament, Parliament can make a law. Even if that law is under the state list in the distribution of powers. And that is how, under Article 252 of the Constitution, this law called Transplantation of Human Organs Act of 1994 was passed because three states requested. Which were these three states? Goa, Maharashtra, Himachal. Then accordingly, almost all the states implemented this law except Andhra Pradesh, because Andhra Pradesh has its own law dealing with Transplantation of Human Organs Act. Because the law passed under Article 252 applies to only those states which have made this request. But subsequently, other states can also implement this law. Andhra has not done that. This is the law which was passed. Why? To ensure the process for procuring, storing, and then transplanting these organs so that we can eradicate what? Commercial exploitation of organs. That is the purpose of this law. In fact, organ donation can be through brain stem death or through natural cardiac death. For example, this brain stem, de stem death is considered to be legal death under this 1994 law. Your brain is dead. But with ventilator support, with oxygen support, with fluids, your other organs can be made to function. Your other vital organs can be made to function. And if somebody is legally dead, called brain stem death, this is where a lot of organs, 37 organs and tissues can be donated. Whether it is your kidney, whether it is your heart, whether it is your liver, can be donated. But if somebody is dead naturally, natural cardiac death, only some of the organs or tissues can be donated. For example, cornea. For example, skin. Skin is considered to be the largest organ of a human body. Only few cornea, skins and some tissues can be donated. But if you are suffering, if you are suffering from brain stem death, that means your brain dead, your heart is functioning because of the ventilator support, because of other support, but your brain dead. This is where 37 organs and tissues can be donated. We are facing acute shortage of organs. There is lack of awareness. There are religious reasons as well why people do not donate their organs and why they do not volunteer donating their organs once they are dead. And now what we have seen 
is that this 1994 law was amended in the year 2011 and this law talks about, this amendment talks about an entity called NOTTO, National Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization. The office of this organization is at the Safdar Ganj Hospital in Delhi. And it is a national organization which coordinates procurement of or organs, storage of organs, uh, registry of these organs, so that at the national level we have the big picture of everything that you need to know regarding organ donation. How many organs do we have for donation? Who are these people who need organ uh, transplant? That national registry is set up by this national organ and tissue transplant organization at the Safdar Ganj hospital. Although there are regional offices also. But based on this, what we have realized is that in 2018, the Hindu had published a report called in Chennai, the heart, hearts beat for foreigners, saying there was a nexus. There were Indians who needed heart transplant, but there were these donor hearts but these were given to foreigners. After this report was published, then we saw a 56% organ donation cases rose for domestic patients. That means more and more organs were donated for Indians. But now the center has ordered a probe saying foreign nationals are coming to India. There is a surge. The government is worried about the surge in the foreign patients coming to India for organ transplantation and that is how now a probe has been ordered. So for that you need to know about this organization, for that you need to know about the law of 1994, how it was enacted under article 252, what is the difference between brain stem death and the natural cardiac death, that is what you need to understand for the prelims examination. Is that clear? Let's look at something else, need a strong government. Mr. Modi says at BJP manifesto launch, as civil services aspirants, do you need to know what is mentioned in the manifesto of the BJP or the Congress or other political parties? Maybe not entirely, unless and until there is something significantly different. But we need to know about manifesto. Manifesto. The year was... 2006, DMK, which is a regional political party in Tamil Nadu, in its election manifesto promised something to the people of Tamil Nadu. What we will give? All those households who do not have color television, color television sets at their homes, we will give you color television sets. Once DMK came to power, close to 30,000 color television sets were given to the people. Close to 750 crore was spent from the budget. Few years later, 2011, AIA DMK in its election manifesto also promised something. And those promises came to be known as freebies. AIA DMK said, we need to match the offer by the DMK. We will give 4 gram gold thali to everybody. We will give juicer, mixer, grinder. We will give buffalo and sheep. One individual approached the Supreme Court. Subramanyam Balaji approached the Supreme Court saying, my lord, this is a corrupt practice. You are basically bribing the voters. And this is a corrupt practice under section 123 of the Representation of the People Act 1951. Isn't it similar to, I am giving you 1000 rupees, take this money and vote for me in the elections. Aren't these freebies similar to this? Matter went to the court. And what Supreme Court said? Two things, although these were contradictory things. 
Supreme Court said in 2013 in Subramaniam Balaji judgment, Supreme Court said these freebies shake the root of free and fair elections. But at the same time, these are not corrupt practices under section 123 of the Representation of the People Act. But if you are a political party who is promising these freebies, you have to also tell the people what is the source of money, where will you get the money from to implement all these election promises. DMK was asked, come here, said what? Why are you promising colored television sets to the people? What is the logic? Said, sir, color television set is, it's not only for entertainment. Uh, those people who will get these color television sets, they will also use this for accessing current affairs programs, news, and keep themselves informed. This will be particularly used by the women who are doing household work to keep them motivated as well. So it is not a freebie. It's not a corrupt practice. The Supreme Court accepted, yes, it is not a corrupt practice, but at the same time, it shakes the root of free and fair elections. But Supreme Court also said something important. When we say election manifesto, when was it released? Yesterday. And currently we are under, under model code of conduct. And one of the provision of the model code of conduct is no new schemes can be launched. No new policy measures can be taken. Isn't this election manifesto by the ruling party BJP promising something to the people during model code of conduct violation of it? The Supreme Court in 2013 Subramanyam Balaji judgment had said that election commission of India Please do one thing, get in touch with the political parties. After their backing, after their support, after their negotiation, you also consider election manifestos under model code of conduct. But political parties have been averse to this. That means election manifesto does not come under model code of conduct. But the promises made in the election manifestos, these are not corrupt practices under representation of the People Act, but political parties will have to tell the people what is the source of money from which they will implement these election promises. But last year, or last to last year, in 2022, Supreme Court referred this Subramaniam Balaji judgment to a three-judge bench of the Supreme Court, seeking a judicial direction that political parties who make these wild promises of largesse should also reveal their in their poll manifestos where they will get the money to pay for them. You have to reveal what is the source of this money, what is the source of money that you will have to fund these largesse or wild promises that you are making to the voters in your election manifestos. Although it was communicated to the election commission by the Supreme Court in Balaji judgment that you have to tell political parties that you also have to reveal to the people the source from where you can implement these election poll promises. But political parties have been adamant we will not come under it. And now a three judge bench will have to decide whether we can give a judicial order saying all the political parties who make these promises, who promise freebies, you should also reveal the source from where the money will come from to pay for these election promises. Let's wait and watch what the Supreme Court will have to rule on this matter. But please keep in mind, election manifestos do not come under model code of conduct. The promises made in election manifestos, no matter how wild these promises are, these do not constitute corrupt practices under Section 123 of the Representation of the People Act 1951. Is that clear? Something else. BJP in its manifesto has dropped NRC but says CAA shall be implemented. And this BJP manifesto also talks about implementation of 
यूनिफॉर्म सिविल कोड सो यूनिफॉर्म सिविल कोड एन आर सी सी ए ए कैन बी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक्स फॉर योर अपकमिंग फिल्म एग्जामिनेशन वॉट इज सी ए ए वी डिस्कस दिस मल्टीपल टाइम्स अ लॉ वॉज पास इन टू थाउजेंड एंड नाइनटीन कॉल्ड सिटीजनशिप अमेंडमेंट एक्ट दिस एक्ट दिस अमेंडमेंट वॉज बेसिकली द अमेंडमेंट टू द सिटीजनशिप एक्ट ऑफ नाइनटीन फिफ्टी फाइव एंड अंडर सी ए ए कैन माइग्रेंट्स गेट सिटीजनशिप नो can under indian laws illegal migrants get citizenship no then sir what about caa under caa of 2019 all those migrants who have come from pakistan afghanistan bangladesh who belong to six religious minorities of these countries hindus christians buddhists jains sikhs and parsis if they have entered india on or before 31st december 2014 they shall not be deemed as illegal migrants when you are not deemed as illegal migrant that means you are eligible for citizenship clear what is nrc nrc is a list which contains the details of indian citizens this nrc was updated for the first time in 1951 which contains the details of all the indians but it was last updated for assam under the directions of the supreme court why because assam accord was to be implemented this we have discussed multiple times i don't need to explain what assam accord is so nrc first compiled in 1951 last compiled only for assam on the directions of the supreme court although in 2019 the bjp had promised that we will implement nrc but now in 2024 elections manifesto the bjp has dropped nrc but saying caa will be implemented clear now let's look at the last topic what is doxing there are some details what is my email id what is my bank account what is my aadhar number if you will hack into my personal account my gmail my phone my computer and will display all this personal information online this is what we call doxing but it may not always be that you are hacking into my system and revealing my personal information online sometimes there is my information which i am voluntarily sharing but i am sharing it with a select group of people but then these select group of people share it with wider people on online sir what are you trying to say you are a hacker you hack into my computer device you steal my personal information which can be my bank account number which can be my address which can be another finan uh, any financial information and if you publish it online this is what we call doxing but sometimes you me and a group of our group of our friends we are having food together we are having drinks together and we pick and we take pictures of each other and you can even post it on your instagram because we are friends but i am not allowing you and i have not given you the consent to share it on twitter or x or any other platform because then others whom i do not want this information to be shared with they also get access to this information that's also what we call doxing and what is the impact it's a psychological impact emotional impact because of doxing for example you reveal my address and what you will do you will annoy me you will log on to dominos you will start ordering pizzas to my home and the delivery partner comes to my home sir this is your pizza mexican green wave but i have not ordered this so you are annoying me because you have revealed because somebody has revealed my address details online doxed me annoying one such thing for example png procter and gamble it has a product called gillette it released a campaign we believe which was an ad uh, which attacked the toxic masculinity somebody posted an image of the 
marketing chief brand officer of Gillette posted it on a website and asked people that you should send angry messages to him. This is what we call doxing. And that is what you need to understand from this article because sometimes questions are asked. This term doxing recently seen in the news deals with A, B, C, D. So you need to understand that doxing is something where it's an act of digitally publicizing a person's private details. That is what we call doxing. Clear? Let's look at two mains based questions for practice. Question number one, for India, a potential escalation of conflict between Iran and Israel means an impact on mainly three accounts, its people, its economic interests, and strategic needs. People, I told you there are close to 18,000 Indians in Israel. There are close to five to 10,000 Indians in Iran. There are lakhs of Indians, Indian diaspora in the Middle East. All of them will get affected if there is an escalation of conflict between Iran and Israel. That is the worrying thing for India. Economic interest. We are also talking about Middle East economic corridor. We are also talking about the Chabar port. We are talking about the import of oil. We are talking about the trade that we have with the Gulf countries. We are also talking about the strategic needs, for example, with Iran, for example, with Israel. All that would be impacted. That is what the Indian policy makers are worried about. That is why we are urging these countries to exercise restraint. Question number two. Distribution of freebies of any kind influences all people and it affects the level playing field. Freebies shake the root of free and fair elections. Comment. Right answers to these questions in the comment section so that other students can also view your answers and you can evaluate uh, each other's answers. That is it from our newspaper analysis for today. If you have understood all the topics that we discussed today in the class, Please let me know in the comment section. Do not forget to press the like button and also do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Why? Because of the two important crash courses that we are coming up with. And for those who might have missed this and joined us late, to tell you, instead of one, we are launching two crash courses. One on the Unacademy app, the other on our YouTube channel. One will focus on the static portion of your syllabus, the other will focus on the current affairs of the past one and a half years. This course starts on 19th of April. The course on YouTube starts on 1st of May. There will be 50 sessions on our Unacademy platform, on our app. There will be 31 classes on our YouTube channel. Every day live, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. But I would urge you to attend these sessions live. Because sometimes if you miss a live session, then you won't attend it again. And you will miss out on some important, crucial information. Plus, it gives discipline to your preparation. When you know that I have to attend this class at 6 o'clock, you will try and complete the remaining portions of your revision timetable accordingly. That is it for today. Thank you so much for staying with me. See you again tomorrow, 10 o'clock in the morning. Till then, have a great time. All the best. Bye-bye. Take care.